Is Dean Chemerinsky online? He is, yes. And I'm going to hand it to Kristen. Uh, this is her topic. Yeah, so I will uh, keep this very brief because I know we only have Dean Chemerinsky for a very short time, and we are very fortunate to have the uh, Dean Chemerinsky. He is a renowned constitutional law scholar who literally wrote one of the leading casebooks on constitutional law. Um, we've asked him here today to speak to about constitutional law generally and how the ERA changes that landscape. Um, I just want to note, you know, it's difficult to summarize and introduce Dean Chemerinsky, but um, he's authored numerous books, a great deal of legal scholarship, and um, articles in the popular press, the Sacramento Bee, Los Angeles Times, widely published and um, a, an expert in this field. So I'd just like to turn it over to him and thank him very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me. As you know, the Equal Rights Amendment, the added of the Constitution would say, equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or bridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. I believe that the ERA has been ratified and should be deemed part of the Constitution, but I also believe it's unlikely to happen in the foreseeable future. 38 states have now ratified the Equal Rights Amendment. That's the three quarters that's required. Now, there's two arguments that it hasn't been properly ratified. One is that six states have rescinded their ratification and thus shouldn't count to the 38. But there's precedent that suggests that they should be counted. And that's in nothing other than the 14th Amendment. When the 14th Amendment was proposed, immediately Southern states rejected it. Congress in the Reconstruction Act, Section 3, said in order for states to be readmitted to the Union, they had to ratify the 14th Amendment. Southern states then did so under protest. Two Northern states, Ohio and New Jersey, then rescinded their ratification. But when it became three quarters of the states, counting all of the states that ratified under protest, and most importantly, counting Ohio and New Jersey, the Secretary of State, Seward, sent a message to Congress saying, three quarters of the states have now ratified the 14th Amendment. Congress then passed a joint resolution deeming the 14th Amendment to be part of the Constitution. And in Coleman versus Miller in 1939, the United States Supreme Court recounted this history and said that it shows it's up to Congress to decide when an amendment is improperly ratified. The other question is the timing. When the Equal Rights Amendment was proposed in 1972, there was a resolution accompanying it saying it had to be ratified within seven years. It's quite important that the amendment itself did not include this language. Several amendments have provisions that say in order to be effectively ratified within seven years, but that wasn't within the Equal Rights Amendment. In fact, the 27th Amendment was ratified by Congress in 1791, but it wasn't for 200 years until it got to three quarters of the states, and it's also part of the Constitution. Congress, in respect of the resolution accompanying the ERA, in 1979 said it would extend the time period for three years. At that point, there were 35 states. Three years later, there was also 35 states. But over the last dozen years, three additional states, Illinois, Nevada, and Virginia, have ratified the ERA. And Virginia then becomes the 38th state in 2020 to do so. Because the time limit is not in the amendment itself, I do not believe that it's binding. And I think that then once it gets to three quarters of the states, it should be deemed to be ratified. However, in order for this to happen, I think it likely would take a joint resolution of Congress deeming the ERA to be properly ratified, at least now with Republicans in control of the House of Representatives. That's not likely to happen. It wasn't likely to happen in the last two years, whereas the Republicans would pass it. The Democrats did not have the votes to overcome a filibuster in the Senate. Um, there's litigation to try to get the archivist of the United States to recognize the ERA as properly ratified. Um, I think there's all sorts of problems with the litigation, including it's likely under Coleman versus Miller, it would deem to be a political question. The reason Coleman versus Miller is so important is if Congress would have passed the joint resolution and say the ERA is properly ratified, Coleman versus Miller says 
that's up to Congress in the area would be adopted. Well, all of this then leads to the question that I was asked to address for you of what would be the legal effect of the ERA being deemed to be a part of the Constitution? And I think there's three effects. The first is symbolic. And I believe that symbols are important. This would be a statement in the United States Constitution that discrimination on the basis of sex is intolerable. Obviously, it's implied in equal protection. On the other hand, there are justices who have said that they don't believe that equal protection applies to sex discrimination. Justice Scalia said on several occasions that because the intent of the 14th Amendment was only with regard to race discrimination, that there's no reason to believe, and he did not believe, that equal protection applied to sex discrimination. I think that the symbolic value of having a statement in the Constitution that says that the government, including the United States and all states, cannot discriminate based on sex, I think would therefore have a benefit. Second, I think it would mean strict scrutiny would be used under equal protection under the United States Constitution. The Supreme Court first struck down any sex discrimination in a case in 1971 in Reed versus Reed. And there the court used rational basis review. Two years later in 1973 in Frontiero versus Richardson, four justices said that strict scrutiny should be used for discrimination on the basis of sex. Frontiero versus Richardson involved a rule for the military that if a man got married, he would get an increase in his quarters allowance. But if a woman got married, she'd get an increase in her quarters allowance only if she could prove that she was dependent on her husband, only if he could prove that he was dependent on his wife's income. Justice Brennan wrote for four justices saying, strict scrutiny is appropriate for sex discrimination for the same reasons used for race discrimination. But there were only four votes for that position. According to the book, The Brethren by Woodward and Armstrong, Justice Potter Stewart believed that strict scrutiny should be used but he said the ERA is about to be passed and that will mean strict scrutiny, so no need for the court to do so. There never were five votes for strict scrutiny for sex discrimination. In 1976, in Craig versus Boren, the court adopted the current test with regard to sex discrimination under equal protection. It is in immediate scrutiny. In Craig versus Boren, the court said that sex classifications will be allowed only if they're substantially related to an important government purpose. And that's been the law ever since 1976. In 1996, in United States versus Virginia, the court added some language to intermediate scrutiny. United States versus Virginia involved a Virginia law that only men could attend the Virginia Military Institute, a public university. And the Supreme Court seven to one declared that unconstitutional. Justice Ginsburg writing for the court, only Justice Scalia dissenting. And Justice Ginsburg said that gender classifications would be allowed only if there's, quote, an exceedingly persuasive justification. And so most lower courts since 1996 have said it's an immediate scrutiny, but have added the there has to be an exceedingly persuasive justification. It's also worth pausing and noting that the Supreme Court has never drawn a distinction between sex and gender, that the Supreme Court has used those two terms interchangeably. Today, we would think of sex as being about biology and physiology, and we would think of gender as identity. The closest you get from the Supreme Court to addressing this was in the statutory context in 2020, in Bostock versus Clayton County, Georgia, the Supreme Court considered Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Title VII prohibits employment discrimination based on race, sex, or religion. And the Supreme Court in a six to three decision held that discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity is sex discrimination. In the context of sexual orientation, the court said is to two men who had been fired for being gay. If they were women, who are in sexual relations with men, they still have their jobs, but because they're men, they got fired. Or in the context of gender identity, it was a funeral home director 
who transitioned from male to female. And when she told her employer that she wished to be addressed by feminine pronouns and dress as a female funeral director, she got fired and the court said, if she were male, she'd have the job, if she's female, she doesn't. That's sex discrimination. That suggests that the Supreme Court is going to treat gender identity discrimination the same as sex discrimination, which would then mean under equal protection, intermediate scrutiny. For your purpose, it's important to note that the California Supreme Court has long said that strict scrutiny is to be used for sex discrimination under the California Constitution. In Sailor Inn versus Kirby in 1971, the California Supreme Court said this, being one of the first state courts in the country to adopt strict scrutiny for sex discrimination. The California Supreme Court has reaffirmed this in many instances in the Care versus Metro case in 1985, the Art versus Workers' Compensation case in 1977, Connolly versus State Personnel Board in 2001, all repeat that strict scrutiny is the test under the California Constitution. So in terms of California law, adopting the ERA isn't going to change the level of scrutiny. It'll change the level of scrutiny for the United States Constitution to make it congruent with what California has been doing now for a half century. There's now a debate, and you should be aware of it, is whether intermediate or strict scrutiny is better when it comes to dealing with sex discrimination. For a long time, women's rights groups were unified in saying sex discrimination should be treated the same as race discrimination and receive strict scrutiny that there's the history of discrimination against women in our society, that generally regard sex as immutable, that usually discrimination on the basis of sex like race is based on stereotypes. But in 1996, in the briefs in United States versus Virginia, for the first time, women's rights groups split on the question of whether it should be strict or intermediate scrutiny. Some women's rights groups adhered to the position of a strict scrutiny, but some said invidious discrimination against women is likely to be struck down under intermediate scrutiny. But affirmative action programs, sex-based classifications to benefit women might survive intermediate scrutiny and be struck down under strict scrutiny. In fact, there was a Ninth Circuit case some time ago that involved a preference in contracting both as on the basis of race to minority-owned businesses and on the basis of sex to women-owned businesses. The Ninth Circuit used strict scrutiny and struck down the racial preference, but used intermediate scrutiny and upheld the sex-based preference. So there is an argument at this moment in time that maybe in terms of dealing with sex discrimination, it's better to use intermediate rather than strict scrutiny. The third area in which adopting the Equal Rights Amendment would make a difference is in terms of empowering Congress. And I actually think with regard to practical significance, this might be the most important because the Equal Rights Amendment has a clause that would authorize Congress to adopt laws to enforce it. Let me give you an example of a law that I think could be upheld under this authority that was struck down by the court. And the case here is United States versus Morrison from the year 2000. Morrison, you might remember, involved the civil damages provision of the Violence Against Women Act. Congress, in detailed legislative findings, documented that victims of gender-motivated violence often were treated in a hostile way in state courts, that state courts were often not available to victims of sexual assault and victims of domestic violence to get compensation or relief. So Congress authorized victims of gender motivated violence to sue in federal court. The Supreme Court in the United States versus Morrison declared this unconstitutional as exceeding the scope of Congress's powers under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, and also finding that it exceeded the scope of Congress's powers under its Commerce Clause authority. Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote the opinion for the court joined by the foremost conservative justice then on the bench. It was a 5-4 ruling. Justice Breyer wrote the lead dissent. And the court said this didn't fit within the scope of the Commerce Clause 
because Congress can only regulate economic activity and sexual assaults, domestic violence are not economic in nature. And so it didn't fit within the scope, Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, because of an 1883 Supreme Court case, the civil rights cases, that said that the 14th Amendment, Section 5 powers apply only to the government. I think if the Equal Rights Amendment would even be part of the Constitution, Congress would have much clearer statutory authority to adopt something like the Violence Against Women Act. And we could come up with other examples of laws that may not fit within the scope of Congress's commerce power or power under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, but could fit under the Equal Rights Amendment, the authorization for Congress. So I see a great benefit to the ERI being part of the Constitution in the symbolic statement and its implications, in moving the test from intermediate to strict scrutiny, and in empowering Congress. I see less practical effect here in terms of California law, because California law is already clear, strict scrutiny should be used for sex discrimination. So I was asked to talk about 15 minutes or so. I think I've used my time. You, but you nailed it. <laughs> uh, Dean Chemerinsky, uh, it's always a pleasure to see you. Uh, and it is an absolute privilege to, to have you presenting your, your very wise thoughts to us here in, on the commission as we consider this issue. Um, so thank you from me. Uh, uh, any pleasure. comments or questions? Uh, how much time do you have, Dean? I have to I have another meeting at 1130, if that's okay. Okay, so we have about 15 minutes. Looks like, uh, Rick, you, you had a thought? No? Questions or comments from my colleagues? Sochi? Again, it, it's an absolute honor to, to hear from you. <laughs> it really my is. Pleasure. It really is. It's a little, so, you know, starstruck. Um, my pleasure. But um, my question is, so if, if the argument is the government only has power over commerce, but the government clearly has power over criminal acts, right? We see the California Penal Code and all of those things. Why is it that there's this distinction just with commerce? What's crucial is to draw a distinction between the powers of the federal government and the powers of a state government. The state can do anything except what's prohibited by the Constitution. A state can have any criminal law it wants, so long as it doesn't violate the Constitution. And in the law that's phrased as the state has the police power, it means it's authority to do anything except what's unconstitutional. But Congress generally doesn't have the police power. For Congress to act, it has to point to authority in the Constitution. And there's not very many things that Congress can use authority. One is its power to regulate commerce among the states. And virtually every federal criminal statute has been adopted by Congress under its Commerce Clause power. Congress has power under Section 2 of the 13th Amendment to deal with race discrimination. Congress has power under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment to implement the 14th Amendment. But as I alluded to quickly, in 1883, the Supreme Court said Congress under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment can only regulate what state and local governments do, not private conduct. And the court used that in the United States versus Morrison in explaining why the Violence Against Women Act is unconstitutional. So the answer to your question is, states can adopt whatever criminal law they want, but Congress can adopt a criminal law only if it fits under some specific congressional power. Does that approach your question? Yes, it does. Thank you so much for that. Other thoughts, questions, or comments from my colleagues? Brian? Kristen, did I see your hand going up? Yes, I had some questions that I would jump in I'll let in you on. go first. Okay. So, Dean Chemerinsky, uh, thank you for that great summary of the effects of the ERA. One of the things that I was wondering about um, as I was looking at this question is the treatment of pregnancy under the Equal Protection Clause and how that has typically gotten even less scrutiny um, and whether or not the ERA would affect that issue specifically. Um, and a second point is related to really coming out of the Dobbs case and the uh, constitutional right to privacy and whether or not we should think about the ERA and how it might change that doctrine going forward? The general answer, and then I'll go to the specific, is it's unclear. Opponents of the ERA are saying 
it could be used to create a right to abortion. The supporters of the ERA don't want to deny that, but they don't want to embrace it either. And so it is certainly possible that a future court, if the ERA was adopted, could interpret it to create right to privacy and right to abortion, but it's not stated within the ERA. And Republicans have justified their current opposition to the ERA on the abortion issue. And it's unclear. Maybe the way to approach it also is with where you began in terms of pregnancy. The Supreme Court has said that discrimination on the basis of pregnancy is not discrimination on the basis of sex. The case was Geduldig versus Aiello. It involved California in its disability program. And the California Disability Program for its employees would provide disability benefits for any disability except pregnancy-related disabilities. So if it was a man having needing disability coverage because of prostate cancer, testicular cancer, or a woman needing disability coverage because of ovarian cancer, there would be coverage. But pregnancy was not covered. And there was a, another case decided the same day, Gilbert versus General Electric, where General Electric would provide for its employees in the private sector coverage for disabilities, but not for pregnancy-related disabilities. And the Supreme Court upheld California under equal protection and General Electric under Title VII. Justice Potter Stewart wrote for the court and he said, pregnancy discrimination is not sex discrimination. He said, there's two categories of individuals. There are pregnant persons and non-pregnant persons. He said, well, pregnant persons are all women. And this was before recognizing transgender men could become pregnant. And non-pregnant persons include women as well. Women are in both categories and therefore it's not sex discrimination. This is a much ridiculed decision because of course, if you're thinking about excluding pregnancy, overwhelmingly you're excluding women from a benefit. The impact is on those who have the capacity to become pregnant, which again is overwhelmingly women. Nonetheless, in the Dobbs case that you alluded to on June 24th of 2022, an argument was made that prohibiting abortion denies equal protection to women. And Justice Alito's majority opinion rejected that argument, expressly citing to and invoking Geduldig versus Aiello. So the court has refused to recognize pregnancy discrimination as sex discrimination. Would the Equal Rights Amendment make a difference in that regard? It's unclear because remember it says, equality of rights shall not be denied on account of sex. If you don't regard pregnancy discrimination as sex discrimination, I don't know that the ERA would change that. Congress though, in response to Geduldig in Gilbert, adopted the Pregnancy Discrimination Act and they've recently strengthened the Pregnancy Discrimination Act that provides protection in the employment context for discrimination on the basis of pregnancy. So what would be the effect of the ERA with regard to treatment of pregnancy or with regard to abortion? It's unclear. We can't know because obviously it hasn't been adopted or litigated, but that's the ambiguity that would surround it. Thank you. Brian? Yes, uh, Dean Chemerinsky, a, a couple of questions about the standard of review for sex discrimination. One is the, the case law that Kristen researched uh, holding that in California, strict scrutiny is applied to sex discrimination, tended to use the term sex and gender interchangeably as if they were synonyms um, and didn't involve facts um, where the question was gender identity or expression. So we didn't find any case law in California that clearly holds that uh, gender identity or expression discrimination is governed by strict scrutiny. I'm wondering if we got that right or... or... You got it exactly right. Up until now, and I alluded to this briefly, sex and gender were used interchangeably right. by the US Supreme Court, by the California Supreme Court. And they were really about what today we would regard as sex discrimination, not gender identity discrimination. 
I do think that Bostock from the United States Supreme Court could be very valuable here in saying that a prohibition of sex discrimination includes a prohibition of gender identity discrimination. That's not binding on the California Supreme Court as it interprets the California Constitution. But I think an opinion by Justice Gorsuch, joined by Chief Justice Roberts, as well as just Ginsburg, Breyer, Senator Kagan, could be quite persuasive in that regard. But the simple answer to your question is you're absolutely right. It hasn't yet been resolved by the California courts. Thank you. And my other question had to do with the point you made about some um, advocates thinking that intermediate scrutiny might be better than strict scrutiny. Uh, is there any precedent for uh, applying uh, a hybrid uh, standard? So invidious discrimination is evaluated under strict scrutiny, non-invidious under intermediate? Yes, there is precedent for that, but it's been overruled. Um, in 1978, in Regents, the University of California versus Bakke, four justices argued for intermediate scrutiny for racial classifications benefiting minorities, saying there's a difference between a racial classification that disadvantages a racial minority versus a racial classification that benefits a minority. In Metro Broadcasting versus FCC in 1989, um, 1999 rather, five just, 1989, five justices accepted intermediate scrutiny for congressional affirmative action programs but in 1995, in Adirond Constructors versus Pena, the Supreme Court overruled Metro Broadcasting. The bottom line answer to your question is, what the courts have said as to race and as to sex is whether it is invidious discrimination based on race or benign use of race to benefit minorities, it's strict scrutiny. Whether it's invidious use of race to disadvantage women or benign to benefit women, it's intermediate scrutiny, it's the same test. And in fact, many of the Supreme Court cases that articulated intermediate scrutiny were laws that benefited women. Craig versus Boren in 1976, women could buy three tube beer, low alcohol beer at age 18, but men couldn't until age 21. Court used intermediate scrutiny and struck it down. Or Mississippi University Women versus Hogan, where Mississippi created a nursing school just for women. The court used intermediate scrutiny and struck it down. So under federal law, racial classifications get strict scrutiny, whether invidious or benign. Sex classifications get intermediate scrutiny, whether invidious or benign. Thank you. Vice Roy, you get the last um, word. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, again, thank you, uh, Professor, for your for your help. Um, uh, uh, as a practical matter, is am I correct that as a practical matter, the Equal Rights Amendment isn't yet part of the Constitution, but won't and won't become part of the Constitution until both houses of Congress pass a joint resolution saying it is? That's my position. There okay. are, however, those who have brought lawsuits that say that it should be deemed to be part of the Constitution now yeah. that 38 states have ratified it. Right. Yeah. Those suits have not yet been successful. My view of Coleman versus Miller, the 1939 case that I mentioned, is mm -hmm. that it's ultimately up to Congress to decide the process for ratifying amendments. And if Congress deems the ERA to be properly ratified, then it's part of the Constitution. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Dean Chemerinsky, uh, I think we're just about at the end of your time, and I want to get you out of here with enough time to get a cup of coffee if you need to before your next meeting. Uh, well, you. It's a pleasure to see you. My uh, pleasure. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much me. for joining us. This um, this has really been a privilege. My privilege and pleasure. And if I can ever be of help to you with anything, please let me know. Delighted thank you, Dean. With you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Brian, would it be okay if we took five? How much more stuff do we have? Um, yeah, well, Kristen's got to round out her discussion. And then we need to go back and pick up uh, the admin items and my memo on antitrust and Steve's memo on hazardous materials. All of that is probably 15 minutes. Can we take five? Tight five? By me, yeah. Thank you. Kara. Hi there. Lovely to see you. Sorry, I'm late. No worries. You missed Chemerinsky. Ah! Oh. <laughs> You would good to watch the videotape after. Oh, it was good. Yeah. Okay.
Brian, what's uh, next on the agenda? I think we're ready to go. Kristen, you you, you should uh, continue with whatever you need to cover. All right. So um, it's hard to follow in those footsteps, I'll say. <laughs> um, he actually covered many of the things that were addressed in the memo in his presentation. So I'm not going to walk through all of those different issues, but I do just want to highlight a few things which uh, Dean Chemerinsky mentioned. So overall, California's constitutional protection for uh, sex is strict scrutiny, which is where Dean Chemerinsky indicated that's where the ERA would take uh, sex-based equal protection claims under the federal constitution. So that's sort of a, a good place to be. There's still some questions about some of the other um, the, the issues within the scope of sex and where those might fall. So uh, pregnancy was one that we discussed. Uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, those things have not necessarily had a clear standard of scrutiny in a Supreme Court case. So those issues, um, you know, applying Bostock to and what the commission views as the scope of sex, we would see that those should also be addressed with strict scrutiny. So those might be areas to, I think, focus more attention on going forward. Um, jumping past the memo's discussion of equal protection, which I, I won't go into, I just want to highlight the end of the memo runs through a couple of other constitutional protections related to sex equality. Um, one of those is the US Constitution's protection for right to privacy, right to liberty, substantive due process. The doctrine on this topic is kind of evolving and hard to pin down. Um, the way the Supreme Court has characterized it differs a great deal. But as was acknowledged, that doctrine overall was kind of called into question in the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs. Um, so that's important to know. But on the other side, California's constitution actually offers an express right to privacy. And so California may not um, ha need to worry about that that doctrine as much. Um, in California, there's a number of other constitutional protections that I just wanted to call the commission's attention to. One, in the aftermath of Dobbs, it was a new uh, reproductive rights provision added. Um, the actual only, the only mention of the word woman in California Constitution right now is in the prohibition on same-sex marriage, which was struck down as unconstitutional in 2010. Um, and there's actually a pending effort to remove that provision from the Constitution. Um, there is a protection for employment and professions that specifically applies on the basis of sex as well as some other categories. And um, I'll note Prop 209, there is a prohibition on discrimination or preferential treatment for public employment, public education, and public contracting. Um, this was, I think at the time it was adopted, I think it was like 1996 or so was kind of viewed as an anti-affirmative action in those areas. And so that's something to be aware of. I'm, that would have actually probably been a good question. I might want to try to follow up with Dean Chemerinsky about whether the ERA might affect that. Um, and lastly, there's a specific provision related to admission to the University of California. So that's just trying to kind of lay out the constitutional landscape on sex equality generally. Um, at this point, the memo is not asking for any commission decisions, but I would welcome any input or thoughts from the commissioners on other work we might need to do to kind of round out what the how we should understand equality um, under the ERA and what our task is to implement that in California, or just any thoughts generally on on this work in that area. So, Commissioner Hebner, just an excellent work. I enjoyed the memo. Um, and kudos on the coup of bringing the professor in today. Um, I hope you sent him a nice fruit basket. Um, I've got one question, and it, it it might be off the wall, but we're we're spending a good bit of time looking at federal law. Have you seen anything that causes you worry that there might be a preemption issue? Because it would seem that the state of California has free reign as I read the con the federal constitution, to treat people with equal dignity without fear that the U.S. Supreme Court will decide to the contrary. 
So I do think generally that's the case. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to lay out the, the constitutional protections is just to help identify where there might be tensions or areas where the federal doctrine might differ. Now, in a lot of these cases, you know, we can think of the federal constitution as a floor as opposed to a ceiling. So California is welcome to go beyond that. Um, the, I think one thing to keep in mind is where there might be arguments that it actually kind of there's tension between other constitutional protections. And one of those things was acknowledged in the prior memo um, related to Bostock and with respect to religion. Um, so though there are some issues where there might be some acknowledged potential tension between constitutional protections. And I think those are the areas that we need to, you know, be mindful of going forward. Kristen, can I follow up? Yes. Um, Relative to the ambassador's question, we're in kind of an interesting position right now in that because the ERA is technically not a thing yet, theoretically, um, the, the floor is either quite low or non-existent. So California, as you said, we, we can basically do whatever whatever we want. We can protect rights um, in this category as, as little as we want or as, or as much as we want. If the ERA does become a thing, it changes the analysis slightly, um, but Assume, assume the U.S. Supreme Court um, reads the ERA narrowly. Uh, we could wind up in essentially the same position where California still has very free reign to go as low or as high as it does. Um, even if the U.S. Supreme Court validates the ERA something close to what its intended meaning is supposed to be, they're probably still going to stick with intermediate scrutiny, in which case, again, California would be above the federal floor because we would be imposing strict scrutiny, which is a higher degree of protection. So. So I, th I think almost no matter how you look at it, California has a fairly free hand in what we can do. And almost anything that we do, even the current state of the law, provides greater protection on sex and gender discrimination than federal law does. And I think that's unlikely to change regardless of what happens with the ERA. Yeah. California's never used intermediate scrutiny. I'd, I'd frankly be surprised if the California Supreme Court decided all of a sudden it was a good idea. I've always hated it. <laughs> Yeah, no, it does seem like California overall is in a much better place. I mean, in terms yeah. of like, there's a lot of interest in these policies generally. So I do think California is already moving in these areas. I mean, that's another thing to be aware of as we're undertaking this work is um, it, particularly around uh, reproductive rights issues right now, the California legislature is very active and, you know, paying a great deal of attention to what's happening federally and how to yeah. sort of backfill where those pr protections are being rolled back federally. So. Yeah, the, the one area where I think we, um, again, along the lines of what the ambassador was talking about, where we might want to uh, devote a little bit of particular focus is, is the question of pregnancy. Um, I, I, I happen to be in the camp that thinks that Potter Stewart was out of his mind. Um, pregnancy is pretty obviously related to gender. Most guys can't become pregnant. Um, some exceptions aside. So, um, you know, so co codifying uh california protections for for pregnancy discrimination at under the category of sex and gender discrimination you know that that's potentially an important move or, or a question for the commission to consider okay thank you yeah no i think in um you know in the employment law context D dean chemerinsky mentioned in the prior memo discussed you know after the the case looking at employment discrimination decided that sex did not include pregnancy the legislature, Congress went in and backfilled that. And I think California also has similar protections in that area, but yeah. it's not clear. Um, can take a look where pregnancy is or is not included in California's protections generally. Yeah. So, I mean, so one of the questions for us, I, I think, is going to be, you know, what what actually is, um, what what's available for us to do? You know, because California already has some pretty robust constitutional and statutory protections in this area. So, you know, so zooming out, you know, one of my questions would be what 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 could we do to this area of the law that would actually approve it? Yeah, and I just want to note back to the commission's assignment, you know, there's sort of two pieces. One is the piece of, on discriminatory language. And I actually think that 
you know, in California law, it's not likely that we'll find much of that. The other is disparate impacts. Um, and those are going to be a lot harder to identify just looking at the face of the law. That's going to require some expertise on how these things are operating in practice. Um, one interesting thing to note is under the constitutional doctrines, in some cases, disparate impacts they're not really cognizable unless you can actually show an underlying discriminatory intent. Right. Um, that's not part of what the commission is needing to look at. So we can look at disparate impacts without uh, discriminatory intent. Yeah, there I so, think the issue becomes the remedy because we're going to run up against prohibitions on the affirmative action. Yes. So th those that kind of issue, um, that's where we might run into issues but it's yeah uh, and there and there there are you know not only there are you know california law prohibitions but there's also federal law to contend with so you yeah. know so again it, it does circle back to the ambassador's question um there are places where we're gonna have to contend with it but i don't know anyway I, i've been monopolizing the discussion um other thoughts and comments from my colleagues just a couple of just a couple of things Kristen. one is my recollection of the precise um assignment involved looking at um, discriminatory, not necessarily discriminatory provisions, but biased language, discriminatory yes. language in statutes or, or uh, other bits of California law. Are, is that a significant part of this? Do you see that being uh, particularly difficult or time consuming to parse through? the vast body of California law? On so I, I do think, you know, we're going to have to take some time to look through the statutes. Um, the Finding that in the case law, which is actually part of the assignment, is going to be a yes. bit trickier. Um, that's my regard, concern primarily. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's a part that um, I'll have to give more thought as to how we might be able to do that, because finding those things might be challenging and then whether or not they've been addressed already in subsequent enactments. Um, you, you certainly hope that we've kind of moved past a lot of that, but it may still be that there are things that need to be addressed there. My only other point is um, occasionally around the periphery, somebody mentions the word religion. If we think um, religion is going to be a significant issue here, uh, I would suggest there be thought on how to deal with that near the beginning of the project, not at the end, so that it becomes a discussion point instead of a torpedo, particularly since um, I, I have yet to see a, a, a well-defined um, explanation about what religion is and which religion's beliefs um, rise to the level of veto and which do not, particularly since there are currently uh, acknowledged religions that continue to view women as unclean and unworthy to hold certain positions. Um, so I, I would not want us to approach religion colloquially as opposed to technically near the beginning of this when it will be less disruptive. Yeah, I'll give some thought on how, how to address it. But as you acknowledge, I think it's a bit challenging to sort of get your head around what that protection means. And I think, um, you know, how it's being interpreted in the Supreme Court is actually a big question in terms of like the preemption issue you raised. Yeah, yeah Kristen, and we might have to have I, I would Dean say Chimersky that we not. Back. Yeah, and I would suggest we not approach it with um, loaded language because uh, some folks might view as it as a protection. Some other people might view it as a cudgel. Um, are we protecting people from religion as well as facilitating brutality based on religion? So I think there's a lot to discuss and I'd rather get that dealt with um, earlier rather than later. Okay, that that's would be my suggestion. Thank so you. that it does not, if it's going to distort, it's better to deal with that at the beginning than the end, I think. Kristen, uh, I have a couple of resources that I can send you, um, not not at the Chemerinsky level, but you know, a couple of lower, lower level things that you could consider. Uh, Commissioner Carrion. 
Yes. Yeah, so um, my my comment is I think we should be very thoughtful when we're looking at the pregnancy analysis, um, because even though we've made comments about, you know, um, most men can't be pregnant, all, all those things like that. I mean, there's trans men, there's non-binary people, and there's all, you know, like the language and the um, inclusivity of those words, I think is is we should be very thoughtful of that to not just simply put it as okay a, a little bit of a this is the exception and not have a thoughtful discourse that includes um just the changing landscape of gender um because i think that the gender landscape is continually going to be evolving as as people um so i think if we are looking at the intent of the era that we create language that is flexible yet clear enough to afford that kind of um, it, it landscape. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point. I did um, have that in mind as I was undertaking this study initially, but I do think it's something to continue to be aware of, and especially on the issue of pregnancy, as you noted. So I will make a note of that and try to keep that in mind as we move forward. Other thoughts or comments from my colleagues? Brian. Yeah, a response to some of the points that have been made in terms of what what work should be within the scope of this. What what can we usefully accomplish considering that California's posture is already pretty good on the issue of sex discrimination? Um, one point I'd make is the one that one that Dean Chemerinsky made, which is that there's symbolic value that's useful. Um, so simply enshrining into law an unambiguous principle, I think, is is useful for its symbolic value. Um, the other thing that Kristen and I have been talking about is, you know, establishing this um, generally applicable principle of non-discrimination as a backstop, so that to the extent there are any undiscovered gaps elsewhere in the law, this would fill them. Um, on the issue of the language, I don't know how much work that's going to be in part because, um, and Commissioner Jenkins can can expand on this if necessary, it's already legislative council's practice to um, revise gendered language to make it non-gendered as they draft bills. So the, and, and you know, it, it has become more nuanced in the last few years than it used to be, but for many years it was um, elimination of uh, gendered language, full stop. So no she, he, hers, his, that kind of thing. Uh, so I, I think the the statutes are are pretty in pretty good shape, and there's already a mechanism in place to refine them as they're touched. So I don't know how much work there'll be for us on that. Um, in terms of gendered language in case law, I don't know what to do about that because- I don't think we can do anything about it. We can't rewrite cases. So unless that case law has somehow had resulted in disparate impacts in the world or something that, that we would look at under that separate prong of our study, I, I don't know that there's much we can do about that. Um, I think that one of the most difficult issues in this study is another one that Gene Chemerinsky talked about, which is the, the discussion about strict scrutiny, strict scrutiny versus intermediate scrutiny in terms of which is best um, in the, because of the uh, concern that you want to leave room for um, uh, discrimination, strictly legally discrimination, that is not invidious, that, that is designed to be benign or beneficial. Um, and I, I think we're going to have to struggle with that to see if we're going to try and codify a general principle in California. That's something I think is worth spending some time thinking hard about. Um, and Kristen and I have had some interesting conversations about that. Um, uh, you know, the other point I would make, and then I'm going to jump back to the just prior one, which is that um, 
we are charged with <clears throat> looking at non-discrimination by the government, I think, predominantly. So private discrimination, I don't, I don't think it's our charge to, to by statute, establish prohibitions on private discrimination. We, we're worried about the government's action. Um, that said, that covers a lot of ground. Um, and so some of the, the thorny things that Kristen and I have talked about are like charter schools. Um, and especially if they are uh, gender exclusive charter schools. Um, I think the issues around uh, gendered bathrooms and sports participation are going to be difficult. Um, not because the sort of the people's moral impulses are are problematic, but just the devil in the details of how do you how do you structure and justify those rules that we would be producing? Um, it's tricky. Um, you know, Kristen and I have talked about like what is the policy purpose of gendered bathrooms at all, right? And and if you're going to think about the extent to which California law should guarantee, and I don't know whether it already does, um, maybe you do, Kristen, but should guarantee uh, trans people the right to use the, the bathroom that corresponds to their gender. Um, what's the poly, what's what's the counter argument based on? Um, you know, and and so some of this stuff it may it may fall into a zone where we have clear instincts, but articulating reasons is in our report. And I think that's part of what we're going to do in our report is articulate uh, reasoning underlying all of these issues. I think it's just going to get tricky. And, and I think those are issues where we're going to have to spend a fair amount of time um, and think with some subtlety and care. Um, I think that's going to be harder for sure than the prohibition of invidious sex discrimination, which I expect that California law probably already adequately takes care of. We can confirm that, but I would be surprised if it didn't. Um, I think the harder thing is gonna be like drawing the line between invidious and non-invidious and to divining what kind of treatment to apply. Brian and Kristen, one, um, it seems to me like one key factor that that you folks are going to have to include in your analysis is um, how whatever we're proposing is going to account for Prop 209. Mm -hmm. So once you start going down the direction of, okay, wouldn't it be a good idea for California to adopt some, some form of intermediate scrutiny so that there is space created for California to provide whatever the opposite of invidious discrimination is, you know, beneficial discrimination or beneficial distinctions among the genders um, in order to 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 rise up previously you know disadvantaged groups um that, prop 209 is a major problem with that article 1 section 31 of california constitution prohibits exactly that kind of thing or it seems to so how do we deal with that in employment and contracting yeah and education right. so, and edu and education yeah so i mean <laughs> so, I mean, there, there might be things outside those categories that we could sort of nibble away at, but th those are fairly large and inclusive categories. Right. But, and another thing Kristen and I have talked about is that, like the issues around pregnancy uh, turn on biology. And there are going to be other sexual distinctions in the law that turn on biology, you know, so. Um, Abortion, prop one. Well, I'm thinking, you know, Osteoporosis education, prostate cancer, testicular cancer, ovarian cancer. There's mm -hmm. just a lot of issues that are grounded concretely in, in your biology that the law may want to set up programs specific to those. And we wouldn't want to do anything that would create any question about, I think, the, yeah. the propriety of those kinds of things. As long as they're beneficial, they're not pretextual. Right. You could go in the direction of uh, the employment law principle of bona fide occupational qualifications. Yeah, I mean, I remember a case that I read many years ago, so I don't remember the details of it. That was a sex discrimination employment case that where 
women employees were prohibited from working around teratogens if they were pregnant, right? And so they were denied benefits because they couldn't work on the like the battery assembly line or something um, while they were pregnant because there was the concern about the heightened risk of birth defects. And mm -hmm. men just simply didn't at that time uh, face those risks. And so I, I just think that it's, this is going to be tricky trying to divine bright lines. And I, I think it's going to require a lot of thought. And that's sort of the first stage of the study. And then the second stage of the study is the one where we scan for existing disparate impacts and figure out how to address them. Other thoughts or comments from folks on this? Going once, going twice. Thank you, Kristen. That was lovely. Yeah, thank you, commissioners, for the good discussion. I really appreciate the direction. Yeah, I think this topic can sometimes be it. It can go in a lot of different directions. Um, there's a lot of different ways we could go, and this has sort of helped to give an idea of how we should move this forward. So I appreciate that. Ryan, what should we do now? Uh, go back to admin. Top of the agenda. We did minutes already, so I think next would be the executive director's report. You have the floor. Yeah. Um, so the only thing meaningful to to note is that we have now spammed out lots of advertisements for the executive director position. Um, uh, and I would like to have a brief discussion about how we want to handle the hiring process. The executive director's position is different from all others in the agency because it's a, a statutory appointment. So the, the hiring decision maker is you all. Um, so, you know, I can't be delegated down to the staff level. You're going to have to actually collectively vote on who you want to select for that position. Um, so once I have a useful body of resumes in hand, I was thinking that a next step would be to distribute them to commissioners and then schedule a closed session, uh, I'm hoping in April, at the April 20 meeting, to start the conversation about the selection process. Um, and I, I want, and then once, once we reach the stage of screening those applicants down to a pool that we want to interview, then we have to figure out how we're going to effectuate that. I mean, it's conceivable that we could dedicate um a noticed meeting entirely in closed session to do um all commissioner interviews um the alternative that i see would be for you to delegate um that interview function to a, a subcommittee of the commission <clears throat> again i don't think there would be a problem with that that would make that the subcommittee would be a body subject to Bagley Keen, but Bagley Keen permits you to have closed sessions for personnel matters. So yeah, David. Uh, I guess it partly depends on how many applications we have. If there's a hundred of them, subcommittees. If there's three, I think the, we can do all of them. Okay. Um, how many do we have? I, I don't know. Uh, Deborah is the recipient and she's been out all week sick and uh, I haven't tried to pry open her email account to look. So I expect, like I said, I expect by before the April 20th meeting, we will have enough to talk about. Um, but uh, is everyone okay with that general approach of scheduling a, a closed session in April to, and, and I would distribute the, the applications um, beforehand so that we could take a look at them and have something to talk about in the closed session. Brian, I just have one question yeah. before people respond, which is, um, do you see an appropriate preliminary screening mechanism? If we get um, 50 applications, or even if we get 20, it may be that a certain percentage of them simply don't meet the objective qualifications we've advertised. Yeah, uh, we could certainly screen out um, applicants who don't meet the minimum requirements. No problem. Um, that, I, I think that makes sense. The harder case would be 
you know, there's probably going to be like a, a pretty stark qualitative break between, for example, hypothetically, people who have legislative and policy reform work experience and those who don't. Um, but I don't know that I could draw a bright enough line to justify doing any kind of that kind of screening at the staff level. And, um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect, I wouldn't suggest staff pick five semifinalists. It's just yeah. from my own experience, I know a certain meaningful percentage simply will not hit the objective standards. And it doesn't seem to make sense to pull those into a commission discussion. Uh, if you think objectively, they don't hit the standards. Yeah, I agree. And I'll do that. I'll screen those out. Um, yeah, I don't really have anything else to report on that. Um, we'll we'll know better where things stand uh, in April, I think. Um, the advertisements I've been distributing, uh, I have stated that we're going to begin screening in April. So people, I haven't set a hard deadline for submission of applications, but people understand that by April 1, they may be risking uh, missing the train as it leaves the station. So, so hopefully April will have uh, something concrete to work on. Okay. That's all I need on executive director's report. Um, I guess just a reminder to those commissioners whose terms are expiring, if you want to uh, reapply, uh, talk to the governor's appointments secretary's office. If you don't want to reapply, also talk to them because they would need to know that they got to start uh, gearing up the recruitment process for a replacement. Um, that's all I have on that. What's next on the agenda? Uh, commissioner suggestions, I think. Colleagues? Going once, going twice, seeing none. Does that complete our agenda? No, sorry. <laughs> uh, a, what I hope will be a quick item is legislative program. That's memorandum 2314 and the first supplement. Um, for the most part, this is just an update on where things stand. Uh, all our bills have now been placed because the the last piece of it, the trial court restructuring recommendations, has been introduced as an assembly uh, judiciary committee bill. So all of our bills uh, now have vehicles, um, and they're moving forward. Um, the The one bill I want to talk about is AB two eighty eight. Um, uh, authored by Assemblymember Manchin, who is now the chair of Assembly Judiciary, which is the first committee that will be hearing the bill. So I think we'll be in good shape. Um, but there was a, a concern raised about the bill, a proposed amendment. And I think that uh, uh, Mr. Manchin will probably make that amendment when the bill is heard in committee next week, next Tuesday. So I wanna run it by you. Um, I thought about trying to explain it in writing, but time was short and it's tricky. Um, so I'm gonna just give you a general description of the issue. So this is the bill on stock cooperatives and revocable transfer on death deeds. And <clears throat> one of the provisions of existing law on revocable transfer on death deeds addresses conflicts with other instruments, conflicting instruments, that purport to dispose of the same property that's disposed of by a, an RTODD. So I executed one of these RTODDs, leaving my house to my son. Later, change of heart, I execute a will, leaving my house to my daughter. Which instrument controls? And when this was, when this was first enacted, the provision that was recommended by the commission, enacted by the legislature. Um, I believe it's 5660. Um, included within it, um, a requirement that the other instrument, the conflicting instrument be recorded in order for it to be eligible to be given effect. Um, the, the whole revocable transfer on death deed recommendation was built around 
the necessity of title insurance as a way of facilitating transfer of title uh, because these the whole point of these things is that they they don't wind up in court so you can't get a court decree uh that your revocable transfer on death deed well you could but you're not required to that your revocable transfer on death deed operated to transfer property to somebody um, by law it operates and the title insurers look at the law and they look at the instrument and they say yep that's the instrument and that's the law um transfer title is transferred but in order for that to be workable all of the relevant information about um, things that could affect the title had to be in the title records uh, otherwise title insurers if if there was material off a possibility of material off record information they won't insure because they don't want to expose themselves to risk um so the whole statute is built around that principle that everything that if, could materially affect the transfer of title is going to be in the record um <clears throat> so when we were looking at this in this latest iteration working on the stock co-op angle the commission decided to make a change to the existing rule on conflicting instruments um we took away at least this bill would take away the requirement that a conflicting instrument be recorded in order for it to be eligible to be given effect and trump uh the rtodd the reason we did that um and why it, we don't believe it will be a problem for title insurance is that we also said if you bring a claim asserting that your conflicting instrument is valid and should trump an rtod deed that should be brought as a contest under the law in this statute that governs contests and one key part of that law is a, a rule that prescribes the relief that the court can grant if they find your contest to be valid okay and it's there are two possibilities and they they hinge on the treatment of a bona fide purchaser or bfp um, if the contestant recorded a list pendants within 120 days of the rtod deeds effective date then the court can void the rtodd notwithstanding the possibility that the property had been sold or encumbered by the beneficiary before that happened so no protection of bfps at all if you record a list pendants and so under that rule that's existing law for contests title insurers wait for 120 days right they're not going to insure until they see whether there's been a list pendants because um if there is no list pendants the statute specifically provides the bfp is protected the court cannot invalidate the bfp's title and so that's really all that that needs to be known for title insurers and the title insurance process to oper operate correctly you know okay there's 120 day blackout period i'm going to wait that out and then if there is a list pendants i'm not insuring title we'll wait for the court decision if there's not then i can go ahead um, because the bfp is going to be protected um so going back out to the prior step we took away the requirement that a conflicting instrument be recorded because any claim to assert the validity of that instrument would be covered by this rule that says uh, you're not going to disturb BFP rights unless you record a list pendants. And so that's an that's an established process that title insurers are comfortable with. And we just push these conflicting instrument claims down into that groove. Um, and that's an improvement because there may be situations where um the conflicting instrument wasn't recorded but the court concludes that it should be given effect anyway so in my scenario uh the court says yeah the 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 will 
that was executed after the RTODD, it's clear that it was the intent, testator's intent that that take effect and trump the RTODD. So we are going to give effect to that as the later executed instrument. Um, if my son, on the basis of the RTODD, had already sold the property on to a BFP, and my daughter didn't record a Liz pendants uh, within the 120 day window, she's not gonna be able to claw the property back, but she could bring an action against my son for the proceeds of sale, okay? So that's what we were achieving was that little sliver there of improvement, which is we were making space for conflicting instrument claimants to claw, to dis recover the funds, the proceeds of sale from the beneficiary of an RTODD who sold the property on um, and it was later held to be invalid. So all of that is, <laughs> is an explanation for how this would work, this new change that we're proposing. Title insurers weren't seeing how it would work. They asked me, why are you taking away the requirement that they be recorded? What, isn't that going to cause problems? And I said, no, no, look, we're pushing it down into the contest procedure. And within that procedure, you're covered. Um, that'll be adequate. And they said, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and they were comfortable with that, but they were concerned about the language we used to do that. So in the first supplement, There is on page one, uh, the, an amendment that CLTA proposed, which is that in subdivision B, which currently says, a claim that a revocable transfer on death deed is inoperative pursuant to this section, the conflicting instrument section, is grounds for a contest under chapter five, okay? They asked whether is grounds for is permissive rather than mandatory. And whether that would, if it's arguably permissive, whether it would allow people to escape the rule uh, about the relief the court can grant by saying, oh, well, I chose not to proceed under that chapter. And, and that would defeat the commission's intention. We didn't want to leave that escape hatch. We wanted to force all of these things into the contest statute so that they would be governed by that rule I described. So their proposal is just to change it to uh, a claim that a revocable transfer on death deed is inoperative pursuant to this section shall be brought as a contest under et cetera. So expressly mandatory language. Um, I let the author's office know that I didn't see that as being incompatible with the commission's intentions. And in fact, it might be a better expression of them. I think the CLTA has got a point that it might it's better to use clearly mandatory language in that situation and not invite people to argue that they have an escape hatch. Um, and so I think that the bill's gonna be amended, um, but it hasn't been yet. So if you have concerns, you can raise them now and I can raise them with the author's office. Uh, if you don't have concerns, if you're okay with that change, then there's a question of whether or not we wanna revise our recommendation to conform to it. Um, the recommendation is not yet in final form, so it's still mutable. We could revise it to conform to the amendment if it's made. Um, so two questions. Are you okay with that amendment? Uh, Commissioner Cario? Yes, I would, I'm would. i okay with that amendment, and I would uh, move to adopt the amendment as proposed in your first supplement memorandum. Meaning to conform our recommendation to that language? That's correct. Is there a second? Any discussion on the motion? Going once, going twice, shall we call the roll? Yes. Um, Carrillo. Aye. Carrion. Aye. Hebner. Aye. 
Jenkins. Aye. Simpson. Aye. Okay. That's all I need on legislative programs. Sorry. You now see why I didn't try to reduce that to writing. Although maybe it would have been more concise. Um, so the only remaining items are, uh, I had a, a memo on antitrust, it, a companion to the Tom Green's presentation. I didn't cover the subject matter that he covered. I just provided you with a process update, which is the, the broad outline is, um, the experts have been organized into working groups, and they're now working to prepare the background reports that I've asked of them. Um, I think it's, uh, I think we're on a good footing. Um, I think that we'll continue this process of doing education during the commission meetings, but come the end of this calendar year, we should also have a, um, a really useful and I think impressive report prepared for us that we can use as a basis for deliberations. Um, and I think, you know, I, the proof will be in the pudding, but I, I, I think the report itself will probably become a useful tool nationally, um, you know, because it's not exclusively going to be focused on California. It, it's a just general discussion of antitrust. Um, and I, I'm always pleased to, when when Tom Green is doing his slideshows, when I see the articles that he's favorably referring to us, and they were authored by people who were in our working groups, which happens a lot. Um, well, I've been really pleased with the, the outcome here. We've got a, an incredible panel. Um, so does anyone have any questions about what I outlined in that brief memo about the process going forward? Okay, so thank you. I, di I didn't present any questions to be decided there. So the very last item is memorandum 2315. Um, Steve, are you there? I, I know he's he's got a box in our Hollywood squares here, but he let me know by text that he had a family emergency and had to uh, attend to it. Um, and I told him that was fine. Uh, because his memo was information only for the most part. This this is the continuation of the work on the recodification of the toxic substance statutes. Um, and the, the material that was within the scope of the legislature's charge to us is organized into two chapters, 6.5 and 6.8. We did the easier of those first, um, and we decided to mostly hold off doing work on the other until we saw whether we could get a bill enacted. So the bill was enacted last year. And so now we're just reactivating the study and the work towards completion of the other chapter. Um, and so this is mostly just a refresher to sort of remind you of that history and sort of the, the uh, practices we've been using in that study. Um, this is one of the big technical statutory cleanup projects. Uh, so we're not going to be breaking uh, policy ground, um, and we're going to be using a very light touch in drafting and organizing because we we don't want to do anything that's going to be so burdened by um, opposition <clears throat> that it won't be enactable. So we're going to be pretty conservative in how we draft it. I, I see a hand. Uh, Commissioner Cario? Yes, the only issue that I can see coming up is really um, the fact that the commission is understaffed right now. Mm -hmm. um, and we have these really two very large um, comprehensive studies that we're working on. Um, could you address that um, in terms of your capacity? Sure. Um, first of all, um, Though the work on antitrust is reaching a stage where it's going to be much lighter for me, um, because a lot of the admin organizing tasks are now done. Um, and so I'm going to be able to, uh, a significant part of my time, though, will be spent on hiring. And I'm, and it's not just hiring uh, my replacement, but also to fill Barbara's vacancy. Um, that process has been abysmal. Um, 
the uh, we've waited we've been waiting for over a year just to sort of clear uh, hurdles that have been placed in our way uh, procedurally, and we're not yet clear of them. Um, so I, you know, I keep telling people in the agencies I'm dealing with, the gatekeeping agencies, that like I'd really like to get this before done before I retire. You know, it's now seven months. It used to be 19 months. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm. It's a priority for me. And like I said, now that I, the antitrust uh, startup work is over. I'll be dedicating more of my time to those tasks, uh, and hopefully we'll get somebody um, and we'll get back towards full uh, staffing. <clears throat> the, in terms of the allocation of the work, um, you know, I think Kristen is uh, doing a good job of handling the ERA study by herself. Uh, the next meeting, she's got a, a student extern who's going to be presenting some material um but i i think i'm comfortable for now uh with her handling that uh solo um <clears throat> and then the other pieces the only other pieces that are really pending one is this hazardous material study which was a statutory assignment um, which has dragged on a little longer than it might have because we did take the break to see whether or not the first bill would be viable. Um, and then the other piece is an assignment that we just got uh, having to do with uh, landlord-tenant terminology, um, which I think is going to be mostly technical, not too, not too burdensome, and it has a two-year deadline. So I decided last year when we were talking about new topics and priorities, my our recommendation and the commission's decision was to kick that particular can down the road uh, for one more year uh, and concentrate this year with Steve working on this hazardous material stuff and see how much progress can be made. So I think we've, we've got essentially three large projects. We currently have three attorneys. Um, so I, I think it's manageable. Um, that's gonna change. <laughs> in 2024, um, when we have all the information and we're ready to start doing antitrust, we're going to have to seriously rethink the the timing and the the length and the content of commission meetings because there's going to be a huge amount of heavy material to get through, and there's going to be lots of public participation. So. Um, I expect those meetings are going to, the antitrust is going to consume easily half of every meeting uh, for a year. Um, and we may want to consider going to longer meetings to give more time for that, especially if it turns out that my intuition is correct and we have a, a lot of public participation. Um, I don't remember, I, I guess, I don't remember which commissioners were here for the um mediation confidentiality study. I think it was just, okay, you, oh, well, this was phase two. I think you missed phase two, Soshi, but uh, Commissioner King was there for sure. Uh, Commissioner McAllister, neither of whom are here right now. That was every single meeting, we would have 20 people in the audience, uh, half of them lobbyists and um, judges and attor specialist attorneys, and they all wanted to be heard at every single meeting. And so, you know, we we would spend an hour at least at every meeting on public comment just on that one study. And and it's my expectation that antitrust, once it gets going, is going to be that way too. Um, we're getting press coverage. People are going to know about this. I'm out. I'm reaching out now to affected industries. So there's going to be people pro and con for every issue. So I think we've got it in hand this year. Next year, it would be nice to have another person for sure to spread that. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Um, I'm assuming unless the legislature does something differently that we may 
be having to go back to um, in-person meetings yeah. uh, after July 1, I guess. Um, any sense as to where we would do that? Well, our schedule is right now is anticipating that. We, yeah. We're not going to meet in July. We're going to meet uh, in August. So yeah. we're going back to two, two month intervals. Yeah, right. I, I assume it would be the capital. Okay. Um, uh, uh, right now, we uh, David Hebner might be the only commissioner we have from, no, I guess Victor King yeah. as well from Southern California. You know, we have in the past had Southern California meetings too, but either way, that's going to be another problem um, because to the extent that we want to facilitate remote participation, um, that's tricky. The, most of you, I think, were present at that meeting in the hotel where we did the hybrid. Um, right. It worked, but it wasn't, it wasn't great. Um, you know, and so it, it would be nice to, to uh, like uh, Tom Green was talking about getting somebody who could talk to us about the EU and, and their approach to antitrust. He's talking about people in the UK, um, you know, and, and that's just not possible if you don't have uh, the teleconferencing. Um, I also think there's considerable value in us continuing to have video t recordings of these meetings. Um, you know, like for example, Commissioner McAllister couldn't uh, couldn't continue to join us today, but I expect she's going to watch the videotape um, to catch up. That's a really nice feature, but it only exists if you have a technological solution to achieve it. And in the absence of Zoom, um, that means cameras and internet connectivity and microphones and wires. And um, I would really hope that the legislature would do something to remove the obstacles to this kind of uh, meeting format because I don't see a downside and I see upsides. Um, the people attend our meetings more now that we have them on Zoom than they used to when they were in the Capitol. Um, I know there's concerns at the local level, the Brown Act, the local governments, people feel like I should be able to go to the city council and look them in the eye and, you know, and be in the room with them and talk, tell them so they can get the temperature of what the people think, that kind of thing. For us, you know, a, a sort of a technocratic body that meets in some small room in the fourth floor of the Capitol, we just don't get people uh with that kind of regularity uh it just doesn't make sense but not my decision so okay. hopefully yeah okay thank you i will say also to to that the capital is starting you know the annex project is moving forward and uh it's going to be hard to find space within the capital that we can use Mm. Uh, because of the the limitations. Yeah. Mm. Great. So the, I think demolition is going to start in supposed to start in April. So. Well, the last time that we had to meet in person when we did the hybrid thing, I I the Capitol was closed to us, and I called around to other auditoriums like Secretary of State, etc. They were all booked because there are a lot of agencies like us that needed venues. And that's how we wound up in a hotel. I mean, we could do that again. It costs money. It's not unbearable amount of money, but. Um, I recall um, um, I recall meeting in UC Davis, I think beforehand, um, maybe looking at other educational institutions that we could use their space for free so we don't use their yeah. budget. Yeah, it always gets harder to get the people from the Capitol to our meetings if we're remote from the meetings. Um, you know, it would be harder for Cara to to like drop in between her other time commitments uh, if we she had to drive 30 minutes each way. Um, and the same with our legislative members who we rarely see. So it's less of a concern, but you leave the Capitol area, it becomes almost impossible to get them. I, I was wondering about um, like 
Sacramento City uh, School Board, where, where they meet, perhaps. Not too, I think it's not too far from the Capitol, or the yeah. County Office of Education out at Mather, possibly. I'm just uh, like a, a venue for, you know. We met at the Port Authority once, I think, in uh, Los Angeles. That was uh, kind of grim. <laughs> yeah. But... <laughs> You know, I, uh, I, yeah, I, I think we contribute. My only contribution to this is cost and efficiency. Yeah. Um, for those of us who don't live in Sacramento, um, it is expensive to get us up there and back. Yeah. I've noticed um, previously we would have two day commission meetings so we could amortize the cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to do commute in and commute out, then we're really limiting the work time during the day to about four hours given yeah. what flights are like um to sacramento and i i just don't think the cost of commuting up and back for four hours um makes sense if there's any other alternative yeah yeah i i totally agree um there was always a hassle and this, the flight schedules change over time and they're often terrible. Um, and, it, you know, get up at an ungodly hour um, to get there an hour in advance of the flight time and back again, um, definitely preferable. Everyone's sharper and fresher if they can just sit down for the meeting without all that trouble. Um, the, the obstacle is technological, um, you know, if, if we wanted to um, continue to do like a hybrid type format, that's possible. And you, we could even have like Northern California and Southern California hubs for that. Um, we'd have to agendize and hold both of those locations open to the public, but it's conceivable. You could have a meeting in LA and a meeting in Sacramento and, and interlink them technologically so that it is results in this kind of a teleconference format. Um, it's just, you know, it's just a hassle. Uh, you have to solve those practical and equipment problems. And if something goes wrong, you're out of luck. Um, yeah. I mean, we'll have to see what happens. I, the Little Hoover Commission issued a report recommending that the state remove the obstacles to state bodies and local government bodies meeting by teleconference. Um, and they lined up a long list of uh, supporters for that. And for whatever reason, it didn't, it didn't have an effect. Um, I don't really know what the resistance is to it. Uh, maybe Kara does. No, without breaching any kind of confidentiality. Um, no, I yeah, I don't know. Anything. And at this point, if they wanted to fix it before the before the deadline, they'd have to do an urgency bill or or a budget trailer bill, um, which isn't impossible, but less. Vice Roy, work your magic. What's that? I'm directing the viceroy to work his magic. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. I've been I've been out six six and a half years now, and it's, they most of them don't even remember me. <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else on the agenda? No, no, that was it. Um, so the no action, no decision on the hazardous materials stuff. Uh, we will continue as we uh, proposed. All right. That's See it. nothing further. See you Stand in adjourned. April. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Yeah. Thanks.